We do all kinds of things here at Word in Your Ear. Video casts like this. Podcasts like this. Crowdcast events with famous authors. Live quizzes. And we can guarantee to make your next birthday one you'll never forget. There's only one way to guarantee getting all of this, to getting it before anybody else, and that's to sign on to be a supporter on Patreon. Full details at this address. Word in your attic, a Zoom with a view. Once again, we're reaching hands across the ocean, all the way to the United States, and we're delighted to be joined by Peter Ames Carlin. Peter, hello, how are you? Good I'm well, you. how are you? We're very good. We I have to say, we've um, for, for devoted followers of Word in Your Ear, Peter is one of those people we've been trying to get to Word in Your Ear for quite a long time because Peter's written terrific books about Bruce Springsteen, Paul Simon, Brian Wilson, I think we're going further back, and uh, just written a book about the glory days of Warner Brothers. And every time Peter's books come up, I think, is Peter coming to the UK? We'd love to have him as a guest to Word in Your Ear. And it's never really... It's never worked out. So now we're taking advantage of this current unpleasantness <laughs> to join you. And uh, it's lovely to see you. And we get a chance to see your spectacular room with its Christmas tree behind you. Where are you? Is it, is it Portland, Oregon? I'm in Portland, Oregon. There's lovely. Little, Look at that. My little tree, my little Oregon pine tree. And well, um, you, oh, you've been out and you just went out and just shot shot that one down, down. Just, <laughs> just ran off with it under your arm, quick. <laughs> yeah, that's my, uh, I'm a I'm a I'm a logger along with every, a lumberjack along with everything else. But, <laughs> that's um, great. I've moved recently, and so it's like so. On, on the, I thought to myself, like, so th I have this office space in my basement, which like should be, and it's got like all the CDs and books and everything, but it's also got mountains of boxes and things that haven't been unpacked yet. And, and so I never go there. And I've taken to working in this, in this distanced COVID world. I just work here in my living room in, in this armchair that I'm sitting in, just quite comfortable with my things arrayed around me. Right. And, um, and it's, it's been working out great, except for things I can't find, like that microphone we were just discussing. Yeah, it's, it's all right. We'll get by without the microphone. So have you been taking advantage of the time that we've all been stuck at home, going through your old souvenirs and and rubbish and old records and thinking, why have I got this? Why have I got four copies of this? Whatever happened to so and so? Have you done that kind of audit? Constantly. Well, especially since I just moved a few months ago. So I'm in this house now, and and I have, and I and I literally had to box up all of my things and go through boxes and boxes of things that I'd had in an attic in a house I'd lived in for 20 years. And like, what the, heck? it's like I, things that I didn't know that I had, things that I had no idea why I had them. But right. the thing that occurred to me is that, that this sort of weird kind of like obsessive compulsive pack ratedness I had as a boy, saving everything like, uh, you know, I mean, I have copies of Rolling Stone from the mid seventies. That, I oh, that I never forsakes you. I think we're <laughs> all still like them. Then later, and I just kept them with me because I was a fanatic and a strange child. And, um, and then years later, it turned out that they became crucial parts of my work as a journalist. You know, and as somebody trying to write books, it was like, oh, look, I've got all my primary resource material right here. Hey, absolutely. All along. You, you never thought it was an archive you were building. You thought it was just rubbish. And then I one day you turn around and think, no, it's an archive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you become a, so I, I, I think maybe like being a hoarder is like in my future. I mean, it's, it's been working for me so far. Right. But, uh, so have you got, what have you got to show us, uh, Peter? Have you got, have you got early records you bought or anything like that? Yes, of course. Well, first of all, I mean, in a way it all sort of starts with this American version of, of with the Beatles, which was our big. Meet to translate Beatles. that into English, that's that's with the Beatles, isn't it? That is, except it's Although you've got a different track list, I think. You do have a different. It starts with I Want to Hold Your Hand, and then I Saw Her Standing There, and This Boy. It's it's a weird sort of conglomeration of with the Beatles, with just a little touch of, of, uh, of Please Please Me, and a bunch of singles. And then it also has these amazing um, uh, liner notes, which are completely bonkers. It, it's like this... <laughs> fantastical version of reality it says a year ago the beatles were known only to patrons of liverpool pubs this was written in like late 63 early 64 and i'm like 
you, really? You know, today there isn't a Britisher who doesn't know their names and their fame has spread quickly round the world. Said one American visitor to England, only a hermit could be unaware of the Beatles and he'd have to be beyond the range of television, newspapers, radio records and rioting fans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, uh, so did you buy that at the time? No, I was, I was just a lad. How old would you be? I would have been about eight months old when this came out. Well, I was, was going to say, in, yeah. Uh, <laughs> But my parents were kind of hip. And so they had um, uh, my earliest memories are, or certainly my earliest music memories are listening to their copies of Rubber Soul and Revolver. So I can remember as a three-year-old when Revolver was the new Beatles record. And I would just sit there and I remember, I wish I had my copy of it here, but I don't. And I can tell that story. I can explain why in a little bit, but um, I would just stare at that cover and especially that photo on the back, you know, the back of revolver where they're in the studio and yeah, it's yeah. black around them. And, and With those I, wonderful I, Roger McGuinn shades. Yeah. And Ringo is in the middle with this sort of silly smile on his face. And there's a light behind his head that makes it look like he's wearing a ski cap with a pom pom on the top, like a little white pom pom. And the others are smiling sort of down on him in a kind of avuncular way as if Ringo was, the least of them, but he had just said something surprisingly clever <laughs> on his face. And, and they're all just sort of looking at him like, Oh, our lad Ringo has said something interesting. You know, so, but, but, but I also had the sense that like, these were the coolest people on the planet. Like yeah. there was no better, more exclusive group of people that you could conceivably be around and to be inside that room. I mean, it was like a snapshot from Olympus. Yeah, yeah. It really was. And this sense, you know, but I, as a little kid, you know, I remember, I know you always like to ask people, like, what, what, what music equipment did they listen to? Yeah, well, go on, go on. Tell and us, yeah. Had, my folks had, when I was a kid, they had a, a mono system. And so there was a turntable and a big, you know, box, you know, of a, of a tuner and a single speaker that had, that was blonde wood with um, sort of black, kind of matte covering over it that had golden sort of like these weird these golden lines that just sort of curled and twisted and I would lie there on the floor on the living room rug listening to she said she said and tomorrow never knows and and just trace those golden lines with my fingers <laughs> while the music was coming in my face you know and this was you know it was 1966 1967 and um, it was a really interesting way to be introduced to the world around me at, you know, cause when you're a toddler, I mean, when you think back, I don't know what your guys experiences with psychedelic drugs were, but <laughs> given the few moments of, that I had, you know, completely bonkers in my late teens or early twenties, um, it occurred to me later that when you're a toddler, it's like being on acid all the time. <laughs> you have no idea anything could happen right i mean yeah. anything in the world it's like you know i lived in seattle with my family and we would drive by you know my 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 preschool teacher was named mrs johnson and the president was lyndon johnson so i assumed that she was his wife and the fact that he was quite a sizable african-american woman in seattle i just sort of thought like well how many johnsons could there possibly be <laughs> I mean, it just, it was, you know, and, and, and just music was constantly in the air in our neighborhood because all the kids had transistor radios. And so rock and roll was just flying around and it was in the house and, you know, and then, and then Sergeant Pepper came into my life as a little kid and it came with those little cutouts. And I remember sticking a little mustache into my nose and that didn't last very long with my <laughs> naughty little toddler nose, but stripes that you could sort of hold up to your... You know, but but I remember lying there as a kid playing with like these little circus toys and listening to like Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds and for the being for the benefit of Mr. Kite. And it was all the same world, you know? It was like it was like the music was the soundtrack to my toys and my little three, four-year-old imagination. Yeah. Wonderful. And the fields were wired that deeply into my into my you know, into my consciousness. Well, Mr. Like, Kite is the is the perfect kind of children's fantasy lyric, really, isn't it? Yeah. And of course, I had to imagine that many of these lyrics were 
you know, were, were autobiographical, that they were journalistic recountings of, so, you know, you know, well, like the lines about like in, even in on, on Abbey Road, when I should have been a much more sophisticated six-year-old, when he talks about <laughs> the like police department, there's that picture on the, in the, uh, at least on the American version of Magical Mystery Tour, there's a picture of Paul dressed in a military uniform sitting at a desk. Yes. And I thought, oh, well, there he is. That was during his police days. All right, Zeta. Oh, that's brilliant. It all, made, it all added up <laughs> in my yeah. sort of like LSD fired toddler mind. But, I, suppose, um, I suppose this is a great truth, isn't it, about the Beatles? That is like Mark and I have discussed this many times because Mark and I are so old, we remember them first time round. But most people picked up on them later or they were younger or they were outside the kind of peer group or or whatever that's the, that's how most pop music is consumed isn't it it's bound it to be the now. case yeah. i've been listening to there's that um that beatles podcast called i am the egg pod i don't know yeah, if yeah, oh, yeah we know it's very yeah. good yeah and so the, he has people on and they talk about the records and stuff and it begins with these people and they're all very smart and they have interesting things to say and it's fun it's a great show right but then they'll say well when did you discover the beatles and i'll go <laughs> Well, you know, I was in grade school in the early 90s. And I'm like, get the fuck, <laughs> fuck out of here. <laughs> like, what? How could you possibly tell me something I don't know about? But then they do, you know. They, they do, have- because yeah. they listen to it in a different way. And right. they very often, I don't know if you find this, they very often know more about it than you do. Because they've gone <laughs> at it with utter intensity and they've learned about it from yeah. the beginning. Whereas we picked up bits on the way, you know, in a, in a different way. Really but then I heard your you did an episode with them, I think, on with the Beatles, right? I with I am the egg pod, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And I was just absolutely, just completely um, absorbed by your perspective of the Beatles, of them being around you at the time, and yes. what it was like when that hit. Because you know, I wasn't there. I mean, I showed up a few years later as a kid. But, but the other thing that I think is interesting is that being a Beatles fan in America in the late 60s and the early, you know, and in the 70s as a kid sort of growing up with it is that, and I think you didn't have to be a kid to feel like this, but we were so far removed from the Beatles that this whole sort of sense of them as these kind of Olympian gods coming down, it's like, that, that's just how it felt. I mean, and there was there was so much that we didn't know. Like the only books I have them right here. Here's I got this. I think I got this for my birthday when I was about six. It's all beaten up. The cover's fallen off, but it's Hunter Davis's. Oh right. Oh yes. Like this was the one book that existed. <laughs> yes, and then, it was. <laughs> when I was six, my granny gave me this book, which is the Beatles illustrated lyrics. Oh, uh, is it Alan Aldridge? Is that, is that Alan, Alan Aldridge? Book. Aldrich, yeah. sorry, yeah. So you can still see, like, to Peter with much love, Granny, Christmas 1969. Uh-huh. And then I wrote, I to emphasize it, I wrote, and actually I just did this this morning. <laughs> you can tell. <laughs> to Peter Carlin, exclamations, exclamations. But oh, wow. there's all this cool art in here, and it's it's such a, I can't, I'm not doing a good job of showing it off. But No, I, I used to have that many, many years ago. It's fantastic. And it all fell apart, I think. And yeah. Ended well, up on, on the walls of Dean Blatt. It's so original to have somebody talking about discovering the Beatles when they're three or four. You know, we've never had that. We've had people sort of, Peter Perfides, who we, we, we interviewed, who talked about discovering the Beatles when he was about 11, and he discovered that Paul McCartney of Wings was once in a group with John Lennon, you know, worked back from there but that's really original to be able to actually remember what it was like when when you were three fantastic well, i know i mean i remember um i uh, i remember like um uh I, I i you know i remember sergeant pepper being the new record i remember my dad coming in with the white album and sitting down and trying to figure that out i mean which is a lot to take in yeah. at any age but when you're five and i have an extremely vivid memory of going to the uh, the drugstore with my mom, you know, the pharmacy at the University Village in Seattle, that was the, the pay and pack or pay and save or something. And, um, and, and they had a little record department at the right of the front store of the front door when you came in. And at the end of the aisle there where they had the new records where they always displayed what the new re- releases were, the entire thing was Abbey Road. Yeah. And I just felt like the wind go out of me. And I grabbed my mom, I said, we have to get that. We have to get that. 
And she said, okay. And she picked it up and I just like carried it around the aisles of the grocery store and brought it home, you know, and just was like, and I remember that it was so much in the air that would have come out in September, I guess, of 69. Yeah. 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 I don't know if this is a memory from the late summer of 69 or the next summer, but I remember I was walking downtown with my, with my family and um, we were in Pioneer Square, sort of like, which at that time had like hippie-ish park. We were probably going to a gallery or something like that. And I just remember walking down the street on a very hot day and somebody in an apartment had their windows open and they were listening to come together really loud. So it was echoing across the street, sort of on those sort of caloric waves. And it just felt like that music was everywhere. Like it just came at you in the wind. And, and I felt at home, like that was the world that I thought was, that was the society that I thought was, was taking over. Mm-hmm. Um, and this all sort of becomes part of the Warner Brothers thing, which we'll talk about soon. But oh, as I grew up, um, here are more of like these weird American versions. Oh, right. Of, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hard Day's Night and part of it's the actual songs and part so, of it. Hard Day's Night, you didn't get the second side of Hard Day's Night that we got in the UK. You got the George Martin That's right. incidental music. We did. With no we disrespect to George Martin, you were badly shortchanged there. Yeah, the, who knew The that? second side of you Hard Day's robbed. Night. Is the second awesome. side, and also first record where they wrote all their own songs. Yeah, yeah. Every yeah. single one is phenomenal. Here's Beatles 65. All right. So it's kind of with the Beatles, or excuse me, um, Beatles for Sale. Beatles for Sale, yeah. I've got a feeling the American editions had one less track. There was some kind of well, needle time issue. No, it, it wasn't. It was, it was publishing. It's because publishing um, issue. in Britain, they they had to pay mechanical, in America, they had to pay mechan- mechan- mechanical yeah. royalties based on the number of songs. Whereas in Britain, they were just parceled up. Yeah. Which is why most of the early Beatles albums in the States have like two less tracks, as two fewer tracks, or something like that. Four fewer tracks. Four, there you go. Unbelievable. And because what they would do is that they would, the, the uh, Capitol wanted to put out three Beatles records a year. Yeah. And so they would take an album, whatever the new record was, slice four tracks off. Um, and you eventually know, throw all those together and get an extra one out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Plus, also the singles, because we didn't have standalone singles. Every single would end up on an album. On an album. So that yeah. was the one convenient thing that was cool. I remember here's my copy of McCartney. All right. That I got as a present for finishing first grade. I was at the end. <laughs> McCartney used to put out his records in June, and so they would always be my congratulations. You didn't flunk this year. But, <laughs> um, but here I want to show you guys. These things, these were bootleg records. Oh, that wow. That was that John Lennon in a suit of armor, is it? Exactly. Of course it is. And um, what's on that one? This one is called Soldier of Love. And it's basically a bunch of uh, Beatles at the BBC stuff. Oh, yeah. Three the K fan club recordings, uh, which I think is also Beatles on the BBC stuff because it's I'll Be On My Way and Soldier of Love. And like these live broadcasts. Basically, it's all BBC stuff, but we had no idea that the Beatles had a radio show. Uh, We had no idea what this was or why, you know, I think I sort of put it together. These began to show up, or I began to find them in the used record stores in Seattle in around 1975, 76. But it was incredibly mystifying because there was all these, you know, it was like, like this is the, um, the original audition tape. But we had no clue what, like, I mean, as a, as a 12, 13 year old, you know, now more mature, but trying to kind of figure out what was going on in the pop. Is world. that the Decker auditions tape? Is that yeah. the one with three cool cats and shake of Araby? Yeah, I've got that. It's fantastically good. Although you can see why they were turned down. I have to say. Yeah. Well, this one is different. I, I, I don't really know if this is the original. It says it's the original audition tape, but it's got, two versions of a shot of rhythm and blues and two takes of, I got a woman glad all over. I just, I mean, I think some of it is, and some of it's live. It's yeah. but the thing is like, sometimes the sound, you know, you would pay extra to get these and you yeah. bring them home with no idea. Like if it was going to be even listenable and oftentimes it wasn't, <laughs> but like absolutely. here's one that I got, which is like live stuff that goes from 63 to 66. Oh, right. And it's got stuff on here. Like, uh, you know, here's like side two is from Sweden. You know, or here's 1966 in Germany with an electric version of Yesterday. 
which was oh. a revelation at the time. Wow. Not that it was great, but it was like they did this. <laughs> and here's like another one. But I would go, and this doesn't even have a track list. I just buy them on faith. And often your faith was hurled back into your face. But <laughs> it was. Because it was expensively. a to be yeah. rip off. But then we get to 1976, and miracle of miracles, Paul McCartney is coming to play in the United States of America. And I was 13 at the time. And earlier, the previous December, as a 12-year-old, I'd wanted to go see the Beach Boys play. And my parents were like, no, 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 you're not going to a rock concert. But then Paul McCartney came to play in Seattle at the Kingdom. And here's the ticket stuff. Oh, He's fantastic. wow. Wings over America. Oh, yes. 80,000 people in the brand new Kingdom oh. at, for the usurious price of $10. <laughs> Did you, and, could you, could you see anything? Um, well, so here's what happened. I was the day after I finished seventh grade, I guess. And I went with my friend, uh, Greg Cunningham and his little sister. And we decided to go to the kingdom super duper early and line up in the parking lot with everyone. So we got down there at about 9 AM and we sat in the parking lot for, you know, seven hours or something. And, and <laughs> there was a vast line of hippies showing up and, hanging around and smoking cigarettes and Christ only knows and cops on horseback sort of patrolling around and all this fencing that had been put up. And, and then we got to the point where, you know, it's time to go in and suddenly everybody stands up and we're all crowded together. And then we get really pushed together and we're really toward the front of the line. But then my friend's little sister had what I would subs began to have what I would become to know later as a panic attack. But just seemed to be, so we had to get out of line instead. And I was, it was the first concert having, I'd ever having played. spent seven hours holding yes. your place. Oh it my god, so that's bad. heartbreaking! It was heartbreaking, it was horrifying. And, and I didn't have the wherewithal at the time because I had never been to a rock concert before. And for and to and to have your first one be in a domed stadium with 80,000 people there, it was like. You know, I didn't know if I was going to survive. No, oh, I'm, I'm a moist little 13 year old boy. <laughs> but we still ended up on the floor, like maybe about halfway back in this right. back thing. And I just remember that when the um, the lights went out, um, the place it was like it was like gravity in a weird way, almost like ceased to exist for a moment. There was this feeling of, you know, and then it was perfectly dark and you could only see like the red lights on the amps on stage and like maybe some little sparkles sort of reflecting like whatever stage lights they had just so they wouldn't trip on things of people's costumes. And they start playing, you know, sitting in the stand, you know, waiting for the show to be. Oh, right, okay. And then, and it was like, oh my God, it's Paul McCartney's voice. And then when it goes into rock show, Ba -na -na -na, all the lights come on and there he was and and it was like it was breathtaking because it was like the god had had come down from a uh, yeah, yeah, let's get it. Let's get it. you were how old 13 that's, that's the most 13. vivid recollection that's fantastic <laughs> so that's well, your first time first 13, concert 80, yeah. people paul mccartney <laughs> it's like 80, people and paul mccartney and it's a brand new dome stadium, which is, and it's a horror. It was such a bad place. If you, you can sort of see it, what it looked like. Can you, can you see that? Yeah, yeah. It All doesn't right. really have, it was, it was Soviet style. It had no <laughs> decoration or anything. It was like they did it on the cheap. And it was such a horrible place to do anything, let alone see music, that they tore it down like 20 years later. <laughs> like 20 years. That's like a, a, a building should be in its infancy. In yeah, absolutely. Yeah. She's just breaking in, in 20 years time, but it was like suddenly they people like like within months were like this thing is an abomination you know and they <laughs> play baseball in there and they tried to do stuff and everyone's like ah it was like being in a very large men's room yeah and, um, <laughs> and then they finally were like oh screw it and they blew it up and they built two other stadiums <laughs> as you do. but um but it was it was it was a phenomenal experience i mean and it was just this sense of, of Paul being there and being in the room with him. And it was just like, how is this true that he could just, and then when he, when he played, he only played like four or five Beatles songs. And I think the first one was Lady Madonna. And when he started playing that, the place just went up. 
But it wasn't even anywhere near as intense as like 45 minutes later when they did that little acoustic set and he played uh, Yesterday, which for some reason at that time was like the ultimate. And I'll tell you, man, in this enormous concrete men's room with 80,000 people, you could hear a pin drop when he started playing Yesterday. It was silent. And, and it was like a religious experience. But the cool thing about that show, which I became to appreciate later, especially after seeing him come around, you know, I've been seeing him play, you know, since he started touring again in 89, you know, I must have, I've seen him play six or eight times over the years. And, um, you know, and that became, you know, they're Beatles shows, basically. I mean, he's yeah, like yeah. The, amb- the Beatles ambassador to the 21st century. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, he's the, he, so, is the, he is the Beatles, isn't he? But the thing to remember about those Wings shows is that all those Beatles songs were in the first half of the show. And when it got toward the last third of it, when it's just one war, you know, huge war horse after another, they're all, all those songs were, the oldest ones were like three years old. Because he had all of, he had the, uh, the um, Wings at the Speed of Sound, which was like the number one album of the summer of 76. Band on and, the Run. And Band on the yeah. Run was two years old at the time. Yeah, which is just full of hits. Yeah. And Venus and Mars. You know, I think the oldest song that he played around like the last few songs in the encores was High, 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 which had come out four years earlier. <laughs> That's how hot he was in those days. <laughs> I took my nieces to see him 10 years ago, almost exactly to the day, actually. And he played 35 songs. It was absolutely. They, they still they both emailed me to say they remembered it vividly. They could remember the entire set list. It was incredible. <laughs> You know, and that I was thought, wing stuff, and there was huge amounts of Beatles. Like twenty of those were Beatles. I, I, I love that. I love those people. I, I was thinking actually, you, you wrote a book about Paul Simon. I, I went to see Paul Simon um, uh, at the time of Rhythm of the Saints, played in London, and uh, so he had a kind of I, I, I can't remember the band. It was probably South American, South American musicians or whatever, and um, and the great uh, Steve Gadd on the drums and so forth, and so he do. He did Rhythm of the Saints, and then he did Graceland, and then he did Paul Simon's hits and 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover and all, and all this kind of stuff, and did some Simon Garfunkel. Went off, came back, fourth encore, I think. He started singing this song, and I thought, I know this. <laughs> Bridge Over Troubled Water. Fantastic. <laughs> Throws in fourth encore. Kind I of like, Hello, like, darkness, my I, old friend. You know, I, I've, <laughs> I've got that number of, of cards to deal. You know, that's the amazing thing about those guys like McCartney. You know, it's it just that sheer number of well, really familiar songs. Live in Central Park record that he did on that tour, the rhythm of which is, I've seen that it's on video as well, which is which is really worth seeing. But it's like you see him walking out on stage. And there's the crowd they said was even bigger than the one they've had for Simon and Garfunkel 10 years earlier. And, um, and, and this vast sea of people in front of him. And they're all there to see him, not him and Artie. And remember how very specifically he made it clear that Artie was not going to be part of this. Like there was not going to be a moment when Artie walked out to do the encores. Like he was not going to open for Simon and Garfunkel is basically what it came down to. And, um, and I, I, when I was working on that book and so acquainted with the, you know, the whole tension between those two and the tensions and Paul and all this stuff that he, um, he, uh, I, when he comes out on stage, you see him skipping down those little stairs and he's surrounded by all those fabulous South, South American and South African musicians. He's got this incredible band and everyone is screaming for him. And I think this is the peak of this man's existence. For everything that Paul Simon needs and wants and loves, it's like he's getting it at the height of his experience right in that moment. And then that whole show, you can hear the crowd cheering the loudest and getting most excited to hear the new stuff, Graceland stuff and Rhythm of the Saints stuff. Like when he starts playing You Can Call Me Out, the whole city explodes. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's not... I am a rock or sound of silence or, or those songs. It's, you know, I mean, that had to have been in that moment for a man who at the time I think was about 50 to be that far into his career, you know, basically into his third career. You know, he had the Simon and Garfunkel years. Then he had his, 
70s and, and to write stuff that's, that is as popular as, as uh yeah. and, that's and as well about paul Simon is that he's yeah. had not one not two but really three rock and roll hall of fame careers yeah yeah, yeah. bob dylan's another example of that he's written some songs in the last 10 years that people would 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 rather hear than the old stuff mind you they don't particularly want to hear the old stuff because they don't recognize it anyway when he <laughs> plays it but uh, but he, he has managed to produce stuff that is as good as the... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, Dylan is, is phenomenal. I mean, it's just, you know, I mean, for a lot of... I, to be honest, this is sort of apostasy, but I find myself listening to the 60s stuff that everyone is most crazy about, like, way less than I listen to the records from the 70s and the, and the 80s and the 90s. I mean, not, you know, I mean, the good records from that period. Like, I love Oh Mercy and I love Infidels and... Uh, you know, and that type of stuff, or, you know, blood on the tracks, and, and then the latter stuff, time out of mind, and especially love and theft. I love that. Fabulous. Song. And then you can put together all the cool tracks, like, you know, uh, uh, the one he wrote with Sam Shepard, uh, Brownsville Girl, which is just such a spectacular, and, and, you know, one of those Dylan songs that people don't really talk about very much, but it's like an 11 minute epic. Yeah. You know, I mean, you guys, you know, at the end of the, toward the end, he goes, uh, Turns out the only thing we knew for sure about Henry Porter was that his name wasn't Henry Porter. <laughs> so t t tell us about your Warner Brothers book. Okay. Plug well, it. Here it is. It's called Sonic Boom. This is the galley, the, the bound galley. It's about um, one of the things that I remembered as, a, as getting back to my early days as a culture consumer uh, as a toddler was when my dad at, at some point came home and I must have been around 1969 with one of those lost leader records that they did. This oh, album. right, yes. Which you could uh, never get. Reprise gave. songbook or whatever they were called. No, you couldn't yeah, yeah, get yeah. them in Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, well, Wild well, Man Fisher, Pentangle, all that kind of stuff. The Fugs. <laughs> yeah, Van Dyke Parks, the Pentangle, <laughs> Wild Man Fisher, uh, plus also Peter, Paul, and Mary and the Association. Yeah. And, the odd new Beach Boys track and stuff like that. And, um, and, and it was, uh, and so he came home with this and, uh, and I was only listening to Beatles records at the time. And, but he put this on and it was kind of like, good God, like, what is this? But then you start reading the liner notes, which were hysterically funny because they were written by this fellow, Stan Cornyn, who was, had been a liner note writer and then became the head of their advertising department. And right around 67, when Mo Austin and Joe Smith really took over the, um, the company, they developed this whole, you know, that's when they brought in, you know, they went on this signing spree starting in 1967. And this was the label, you know, Warner Reprise was the home of Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin and the comedian Bob Newhart and Peter, Paul and Mary were like one of the hit bands that they brought in. And then, you know, because both Jack Warner, they were two record companies that had come together. Warner Brothers, which obviously was affiliated with the Warner Brothers movie studio that was owned by Jack Warner at the time. And Reprise, which had been started by Frank Sinatra. And what Jack Warner and Frank Sinatra had in common was that they both hated rock and roll. <laughs> and so yeah. The height of, so Warner Brothers began in 58 and, uh, and, and Sinatra started Reprise in 1960, both with the marching orders to the label bosses, no rock and roll. <laughs> yeah, it was all kind of Bill Cosby, wasn't it? And spoken word and stuff. That's Cosby right. Was on it. But the amazing thing about Warner Brothers is that uh, when Jack Warner started it in 58, the first uh, president was this guy named Jim Conklin, who had previously been, you know, had worked his way up through Capitol Records and then was a very successful president of Columbia Records in the early 50s and retired at like 42 years old and started like the, the Grammys and some other things, you know, as, I mean, I, he was involved with all sorts of stuff, but yeah, then yeah. Warner brought him out of retirement and said, I want you to start a, a record company that's going to be a rival to Columbia and Capital, but no rock and roll. <laughs> and, also, and also you only have $2 million to start the entire thing from scratch. And which was the budget of a B movie. He figured he would give up one B movie to start a record company. Right. That, Right. And so they didn't have enough money to sign artists, like real artists. So they brought in like, that's why you have all these records that like Tab Hunter was like, you know, he'd had a hit on Doc, but he wasn't a singer, like no. by any stretch. 
So there was him, and then they had like all these movie stars and TV actors who they signed to recording contracts, which is why Jack Webb from Dragnet has like these albums reciting love song lyrics. <laughs> But, but the other thing that Conkling did is that he signed, his, his wife came from a musical family. I think it was the King family singers. And, and, and they had all these in-laws and friends and relatives who were pretty well-known musicians, but they were all signed to other labels. So what Conkling did was a bunch of secret deals where he had them record music for him, but under pseudonym, you know, anonymously. And, and so then he handed it over to these executives, all these finished recordings saying, find a way to compile these into, into, into album. And um, they had to kind of just make up concepts to fit these things together. And they were getting punchy and they did a lot of it under the influence of whiskey. And so one of the first albums released by Warner Brothers was literally called Music for people with three dollars and ninety-eight cents plus tax, if any. <laughs> and there was another called um, um, "Terribly Sophisticated Songs," and the subtitle for that was "Unpopular Music for Popular People." And you know, along with like Tab Hunter Records and Sound Effects Records, I mean, it was this bizarre thing. And and they gradually sort of like, you know, and so obviously they were losing tons and tons of money because they're trying to sell this stuff in competition with Elvis Presley and Chuck yeah, Berry, yeah, yeah. you know, all these great young, you know, the, you know, the rock and roll happening things. And, but still no rock and roll, no rock and roll. And finally, in around 1964, as a result of a distribution deal they had with, um, um, da, 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 da. Now I'm forgetting the name of the British record company that had the Tula Clark and also had the Kinks. Oh, Pi, Pi, Pi. They did a distribution deal, so so they could release Pi Records in the U.S. And um, the summer of '64, and you really got me. Is it is still in the bottom of like the Hot Hundred or you know in England, but it's rocketing up. And Mo Austin, who was then just you know who had come up through. Uh, through reprise and uh, they merged with Warner Brothers in 1963 um, because Jack Warner wanted to sign Frank Sinatra to a movie contract and part of the sweetening was okay we'll take your money losing reprise off right. your hand. <laughs> and you know so you can erase all that debt from your from your ledger and Frank was like thank God but Mo managed to figure it out that like he could sort of get the kinks in through the back door because he wasn't signing the kinks. They were already signed. Right, you know? right. And so you really got me. They released it and it rocketed into the top five in the U S and suddenly there's this huge flood of money coming in and the up, the, you know, the, the top people at Warner brothers are suddenly maybe a little less upset about this right, no, sure, because sure. suddenly they're beginning to make a little more money. And they had hits with the, you know, Bob Newhart as a comedian and, and yeah, Peter Paul and Mary. But the things began to loosen up. And finally, in around late 66, Joe Smith, who was the head of Warner Brothers Records, who had come up through that end, he was sort of the general manager of Warner. Mo Austin was the general manager of Reprise. And they were basically the same company, just with different labels and slightly different staffs. And, um, but Joe signed The Grateful Dead in the summer of 66, and a couple of weeks, you know, a month or two later, Mo signed Jimi Hendrix. And, uh, you know, and then, you know, the, the Dead's first record didn't do well, but Hendrix's record popped out of the box. And then the Monterey Festival happened in June. And there was a sudden frenzy of signing people from, you know, Janis Joplin got a ton of money from Clive Davis. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Like the Steve Miller band signed a deal with Capitol for like, eight hundred thousand dollars or something i mean it was a phenomenal amount of money for the time but so warner mo eventually went to after monterey and the uppers the guy uh, who had been the who was basically the chairman of the company and had been running everything and making the a and r decisions finally told them like look i have no idea what's going on anymore you guys sign whoever you want to sign and what mo austin did is that he went to the a and r staff in the like late summer, early fall of 67. And he said, I need you guys, we need to stop trying to make hit records. Let's just make good records and turn those into hits. And so he sent young Lenny Warrenker, who was like a junior A&R guy at the time, 
And and he and and Lenny says, I know where all the cool artists are. And Mo said, Great, sign them. And he came back with uh, Van Dyke Parks and Randy Newman, who was had been his best friend since he was like five years old, and uh, the Fugs and uh, uh, Captain Beefheart. Ry Cooter, presumably. Ry Cooter came in a year or two later, but okay. he was the scene. And while they were doing that, then they gave. The, the guy that was the head of the advertising department decided to go to law school. And so they took the Stan Cornyn guy who was a liner note writer and elevated him to the chief of advertising largely because when they asked him about advertising, he said he hated advertising. Didn't want, didn't want anything to do with it. And they said, great, you're hired. You're our man. <laughs> and so then he began the series of ads that were and these were full page ads that were in Rolling Stone and in underground newspapers. And uh, that this is how oh, he would. Oh, God. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Win a yes. bug dream date competition. We did a piece on this in one of the magazines. Oh, it was so was funny. Part of a series of ads, and they would have this big headline, and then like a little picture, and then like these weird little essays. And, and, that, and like this one's obviously a satire of like teen magazine contests. So. Imagine a dream date on the town with your favorite bug and all that that can imply. It could be yours. And they tell you, <laughs> and, and so this is Stan's actual scrapbook that his son loaned me. Stan passed away. Oh, from. really? Oh, fantastic. Oh, that's beautiful. So, okay? they, yeah, I, I remember some of those. There's a, uh, there's a one though. They, they always had really long copy, didn't they? And, and about yeah, there's and this, it, one. this it, is one, one of the famous ones. It was for Van Dyke Park song. Oh, like how much it cost? Yeah, come on. Oh, yeah. that's right. Because it was we, a we, massive, we, massively unsuccessful, and they bragged about how much money they cost. Yeah, how we lost thirty five thousand five hundred nine dollars and fifty cents on quote the album of the year. Yeah, because yeah. it's stiffed. It well, no, but, but it made them look fabulous, didn't it? The idea that they really believed in it. That was the whole point of it. And yeah. So it was a couple of years. So, so by 1968, Rolling Stone did an article about, like, where do you go in L.A. where cool things happen? And it was like this club and, and this head shop and this place and also the Warner Bros. The Warner Reprise headquarters in Burbank. Because they Mo hired all these young, cool people to be executives who, many of whom had never worked in the music industry, and many of whom were 25 or younger. There were a yeah. bunch of freaky freaks who were, because they understood the music of the moment. Completely. And, and they, you know, they, they were the, fa I mean, to my, to my mind, in my lifetime, they were the first hip record company. You were aware it was a hip record company. Because if it was on Warner's, it was worth hearing, you know. And that's what happened. So people would go, like, there was a guy who became an executive at Warner's later. But at the time, he was working at, like, a record store in Chicago that was near, like, Northwestern University or something. And he said that people, like, students used to come in and say, what's new this month? But then starting in around 1968, 69, they would come in and they'd say, what's, what's new on Warner's? Warner Brothers? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It appeared if it was on Warner Reprise, it was going to be cool. Here's another corn and ad. This is for the Grateful Dead. The Pig oh, Pen Pig Lookalike Pen Pen look look Contest. Superb. <laughs> oh. but the, I don't know if it's in this book here, but there's an ad that he did for Randy Newman. For Randy Newman's first album. And the headline is, once you get used to it, his voice is really something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that was how he would, you know, it was a whole sort of like self-lacerating thing. This was the first one that he did, an open letter to Jethro Tull. Oh, wow. Well, Jethro so Tull them. Was. They were, they were awards, weren't they? Yeah. They, yeah. And so, uh, but the thing is, they were unknown. They were big in, uh, the, UK. In, in the UK, but nobody knew them in the US. So Warner was, Warner Reprise was bringing them over. So Stan wrote this ad saying, um, basically, and so this is an open letter to Jethro Tull. Uh, he says, if you have come to the United States, you are, in a sense, a visitor and guest. Your behavior is being, at present, closely scrutinized from coast to coast. <laughs> what you sing and how you play is about to mark the difference between continued anonymity and future fame. But right now, the reaction of most of us Yanks is, who in the merry hell is Jethro Tull? <laughs> <laughs> Who toured with with uh, Roxy Music, I think, at one stage, didn't they? And, and they were both seen as just being eccentric English acts in, in extraordinary stage wear. 
Yeah, exactly, exactly. And so, uh, and then he quotes, like, here's a blurb from some, from a publication in the UK called the Northern Review, that's like a great review. But then in the end, he goes, he says, he says, so as we said, JT, you know, Jethro Tull, a smashing review, but who in the merry hell was the Northern Review? <laughs> <laughs> I can't say I know. So is you, can people get your book in the UK? That's a good question. Um, I'm not, to be honest with you, I'm not entirely sure that we have a UK publisher. All right. Well, but they can probably get an import they, copy. They, of they course. can get it on, on Amazon. Amazon has everything. Yeah. yeah. Um, I... And so, uh, but, you know, but the thing about Warners is that Mo started this, you know, they, Mo kind of became sort of the, you know, sort of the superior, you know, Joe, be, he sort of became the chairman and Joe Smith was the vice chairman and they had a really good partnership for a long time. But Mo was really kind of setting the stage, and and basically they became like the artist-friendly label. Yeah. And he had come up through Verve Records, a jazz records label, and um, had learned there that it was possible to make records that focused that that kind of microcasted toward a small audience. But they would make work with the best artists, let them make whatever albums they wanted to make, and if they sold fifty thousand copies, they'd make money. Yeah, and yeah. you know, and so he just took that and extended that into the rock and roll world, and um, but with this idea that they were going to put let the artists do whatever they wanted, basically support them for albums on end, even if they weren't quite finding their audience, if they were good, if they liked the record, and then something good was going to happen. He figured, and so it was like you take a band like this sort of lukewarm, sort of star-crossed British blues band like Fleetwood Mac. And it was like, they kept them, you know, their records didn't sell at all, really, in the U.S. I think they had one record that sold nearly half a million copies, one of the early ones, maybe it was Bear Trees or something. And then they had a bunch of, but then they kept losing their guitarists and songwriters, and they kept having to rebuild the band and rebuild the band. And they held on to them because they had a nice cult audience that came to see their shows, and um, they, made, they liked the records, and Mick Fleetwood was really fun and easy to work with because he was there, like served a lot of the time as their manager. And so it was, it wasn't unpleasant having them around. So they kept them on and then were the they losing came, money on them? They were sort of probably kind of breaking even a little bit on them, but it was just, it was just good. You know, they just, it was just a good band to have on the label. And then, you know, they lose Bob Welch in 1974 and they have to rebuild all over again. And Mick comes in in early 75 and says, you know, this new record we have with these two new American kids is different. It's quite good. <laughs> yeah, it's quite good, actually. <laughs> and I think you should give this a push. And Mo was like, yeah. So they threw a little extra money on it and kind of relaunched the band. And then that sells three million copies. So suddenly they're doing well. And then a year and a half later, they put out rumors and it sells 20 million copies. And they had put out like seven money losing records and had the patience to sit with them that entire time. I can't help but think I often I look at rumors. And the thing that amazes me most about rumors is the cover. Yeah. You know, the cover is, is Mick Fleetwood and Stevie Nicks. And he's got a pair of, you know, dependents hanging from, you know, from his crotch. I don't think there's another record company in the world that would have let them put out that, that cover. Because they just thought it's their idea, wasn't it? It was his idea. If the band want to, if the band want to do it, they do it. Yeah. You know, Mix. Um, I think one of his memoirs or autobiographies or whatever, he talked about his divorce from, I guess, his first wife or something, and the big symbolic moment, those things hanging from his belt, in in a, you know, ball. They were two, you know, balls essentially. Yeah. Just like playground balls of a sort. Yeah. But they were heavily symbolic for him. And, and apparently one of the, the, the sort of the, the, the signal moments of his breakup with his wife when he went to the drawer in that family, you know, in the house where they live and collected his balls and brought them over to where he was staying. <laughs> Those two. And it was like, well, I guess, you know, you don't need to be Sigmund Freud to figure this one out. <laughs> Who says that rock and roll, uh, you know, produces cases of arrested development? <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, what could, what could that mean? I, I know. I'm stumped. 
So what are you working on now, Peter, now that your Warner Brothers book is done? I'm working on a book about REM. All oh, right. Fantastic. Okay. Okay. And, um, and it's actually, it's quite, you know, I mean, obviously, I mean, there's been some stuff about REM, but, 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 you know, and, um, Tony Fletcher wrote quite a big book about them, sort of based on his years of reportage. But it felt like, you know, it's been a while since that book came out and there's aspects of the story and and, and I think sort of part of their, uh, you know, their legacy and that, that it just felt to me like that there was another book out there that I was looking for. And I thought, you know, you get, I'm sure David, you have the same, you know, you, there's a book you want to read and it doesn't exist, so you got to write it. Right, right, right. So we traditionally uh, climax these chats by asking people to talk about or to just show us what's the greatest record ever made. And I know you've been thinking about this, Peter. Oh, you been lying like awake it. at night, I'm sure, <laughs> agonizing. Well, you know, it's a bunch of, uh, as, our, as our incoming president would say, it's a bunch of malarkey. Because one day it's bit, you know one day Absolutely. it's Pepper, the next day it's it's Exile on Main Street, the day after that it's you know it could some days to me it's it's Lana Del Rey's last record. I love that yeah. album. All so right, much. and that's a court and spark of the 21st century. A brilliant record. Oh, but I gotta oh. say, for me, it all comes down to this one. Pet all Sound. right, oh, okay, yeah. the full. Uh, now are you talking about okay. the sessions? Or are you talking about the record? You're talking about the original record. I'm talking about the original record, but since right. this is the completest version of it. Okay. And I did. What have do you get on that? Do we give us some, uh, an example of the kind of things that you, the, the out, these are outtakes and stuff. Yeah, well, there are outtakes in here. I mean, it's the full record in both the original mono mix and a stereo mix. And then there's just like tracking session stuff. Yeah. Um, a couple outtakes. But the real interesting thing is just to hear him. Um, putting the, you know, putting it together and talking to, you know, and, and creating the arrangements sort of in real time. Yeah, yeah. Coaching the musicians through it and hearing how he would layer these sounds and then put the voices together and all that. That's spectacular. It's so um, rare, it's so rare to hear, um, I can't think of another example, where a guy like that, a producer, composer, is directing a bunch of really good session players. So well, these are not people who have trouble keeping in tune or anything like that, are they? If you yeah. ask them to do it, they can do it. You know. Yeah, 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 exactly. There's there's actually a really interesting session tape. It might be on the smile box of um Brian coaching uh the bass player Carol Kay and trying to explain to her that at the end of the verses of Surf's Up, that he needs the rhythm to just sort of ebb to just sort of to have it sort of fall apart a little bit for a couple bars and she's like what do you mean fall apart like she's having trouble wrapping her mind around this idea of of just having the meter and everything fade out and he was explaining she says like well and, and at this point she's almost sort of joking around she's like but it upsets me when that happened i get upset. and he goes you mustn't carol you mustn't be upset and and then the next track, the next take, she's got it perfect, you know. But he's asking her to do something that's beyond, like what it's that's so improper. Yeah. But yeah. she's smart enough and musician and artist enough to understand exactly what he's looking for and to be able to, you know, paint outside the line. Right, right, right. So, but well, REM were also a Warner Brothers band, you know. Yes, from, of course. And part of the reason, I mean, and to connect these two things. Part of the reason why um, they were they signed for Warner's for less than what they had been offered, I think, by Clive Davis at Columbia, almost you know because Peter Buck had known since he was a teenager listening to those those Lost Leaders records and hearing Captain Beefheart and Van. That's Hart right. As a fourteen year old in a crappy, he dusty little town in Georgia, that this record company was different. And they will, they will stick with us until we yeah, well, kind of, uh, until we find our rhythm, which was kind of true, wasn't it? I mean, they, 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 they were great, those first records, but they didn't really click till late, late eighties, really. Yeah, they were great, but they were, you know, but they built the interesting thing about REM is that really for about the first 17 years of their career, every record that they put out was bigger than the one before and yeah. every tour they, they made was bigger than the one before. And it just kept going up and up and up and up. 
until they got to documents, which was the last record they did for IRS, Miles Copeland's label, um, which went platinum. And then they did, then they jumped over to Warner's because they didn't like IRS's international distribution. Because they, they just, nobody knew them in, in England or, or in, in Europe, I guess, a lot of places. They'd get uh -huh. there to play and they couldn't find their own records in the store. Yeah. It aggravated them. So they went to Warner's and then Green sold 3 million copies. And then, uh, and then they did Out of Time and Automatic for the People and then uh, Monster. And those were back to back to back, like, 10 million plus cells. Yeah, yeah. So, I have done it. For me, the classic Warner Brothers band will always be, and we haven't mentioned them, so we ought to mention them, Little Feet. Oh, yeah. Little, Little Feet, who were just an extraordinary cult in this country, uh, which, you, you know, the, the, the famous occasion when they came over as part of the Warner Brothers music show in the UK, which is headlined by the Doobie Brothers, Montrose, Bonnaroo, Tower of Power, Little Feet. But Little Feet were the stars, and nobody in that package was expecting it at all. Right. I, including I, including Little Feet including themselves. Including Little Feet. Just astonished, weren't they? they? They played the Rainbow on a Sunday afternoon because that was the only time they could get them in to play a London show. And they opened the show for the Doobie Brothers. And they, they, I think they came back for three encores, and they were the sport group. They were almost embarrassed at how well it, I've never seen anything like it. Lowell George stood there looking out at people and he said, you people are crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it, it really it was a really very emotional thing, you know, and that was very much a Warner Brothers cult because the people who loved them were the same people who loved, I don't know, Emmy Lou Harris and Ry Cooder and, and, you know, that stuff was just terribly terribly hip particularly in the west end of london at that well, time bill payne, i talked to bill payne about um uh their signing to warner you know and he told me a lot about how the group got together and how he met lowell and, and the whole business and then he said that um they um they went in and uh auditioned for lenny warrenker in his office he was the head of a and r at the time and it was just bill and lowell and they played like two or three of the songs they'd written and he was like, great, go up to Mo's office and sign a deal. Like, you're in. Like, that was all. It's like he didn't need to hear the band. Wonderful. He like, he was just so impressed by the songs and by those two guys. That was all he needed to know. Yeah. And they loved them at that label. And they worked and worked and worked to, to get them, you know. And so it was that tour. They put them on that tour. And when they finally had that breakthrough moment there in England, you know, they were thrilled for them. That was the payoff for, you know, that was a big expensive package tour that they did. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the one real big thing they got out of it was that they broke little feet in the UK and Europe. And they were always bigger over there than they, than they were over here. I mean, they had a moment with the uh, Columbus and I guess they were on the verge of, uh, you know, something big, but then Lowell passed away. So, yeah, yeah. And was breaking up. It was the only case where I've ever seen where the two brothers came on stage and you kind of felt sorry for them, that they had to come after that. And I think they started their set by saying, ladies and gentlemen, little feet. And got, <laughs> another, got another round of applause for the support group <laughs> behind gritted <laughs> teeth. <laughs> and of course, they were just in a brief valley between the sort of the Tom Johnston sort of, you know, the early rock and roll yeah, stuff. Yeah. Then the Michael McDonald year. The Michael that McDonald. The same year that Taking It to the Streets came out. Yeah. And suddenly they, they exploded into that even bigger phase. Yeah. As another classic Warner Brothers sleeve uh, cover design, which Mark and I were talking about not long ago, the, the Doobie Brothers appear naked on the back of the cover of Toulouse Street, don't they? Which was a fashionable thing at the time. There's a naked picture of the Allman Brothers sitting in a river, wasn't there? <laughs> Everyone was doing it. <laughs> but, the, but they weren't... Uh, there were no oil paintings, were they? <laughs> must be honest. They hadn't been to the gym, had they? The no, they had the new brothers, I don't think. Yeah, so. but they still had the... You know, they still had that youthful... Sort yes, of glow. You could eat crap and drink all the time and be skinny as a rail. Whereas now, like, all those bands are still together, but you do not want to see them naked. <laughs> no, you don't. Peter. It's been lovely to talk to you. You too, and, and, uh, is, is the sun right? The sun's come up in Portland, Oregon. 
it's Didn't as you can see it's it here it's dark <laughs> it's it, in in the winter in portland to say the sun has come up is really you're stretching it you, oh is it really is it yeah, really with a little underwater it's, it's very gray i mean we go through periods where it does get blue and sunny for a little while but you really gotta you know hunkering down is you know well, it I mean, looks a lot lighter than when we started <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it's it's a lot. Like, I've been in Britain in the in in the in the uh, in the winter, and it's a little bit like that, only with I think a lot more rain. But it's uh, you know, you're painting a very attractive picture. <laughs> it's, it's darker it's than Britain Seattle, with a lot more rain. Yeah, I grew up in Seattle, and my and uh, Seattle has over the last twenty five years become like the coffee capital of of the universe. Um, but before that, it was the amphetamine capital of the universe. <laughs> You know, my dad explained, my dad's a psychologist, and it was just like, people need something to get them through the winter. <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah, I'm sure. It. I'm sure. Yeah. So it's Scandinavia. Um, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Except with less pickled fit. Well, look, lovely to talk to you. Terrific to talk and, to you. Uh, and it'd be lovely to catch up with you in real space if uh, when this bloody war is over, as we say. And, uh, and you know, people are, are crossing the Atlantic once more to talk about their books. And, uh, that, man, I've, it's been a while since I've been in England. I think the last time I was there, I saw you. Remember, we, it, uh, we went for a drink with Paul DeNoyer. You were working on your Paul Simon book, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that was great fun. That was a, yeah. Well, we shall we shall do it again. Yeah. Don't worry. At some point in the future. Word in your attic. A Zoom with a View.